So I'm pleased to first welcome Congressman Mike Flood to the stage. Congressman Flood represents Nebraska's first district. And in November, just this past November of 2023, Congressman Flood introduced the Improving Measurements for Loneliness and Isolation Act, bipartisan bicameral legislation that would establish a national working group to formulate recommendations for standardizing measurements of loneliness and isolation. The, Cong uh, the coalition has been so pleased to cultivate really just a, a strong relationship uh, with Mr. Flood and his team and are delighted to have him on the stage with us this afternoon. Let's welcome Congressman Flood. Thank you, Flood. Thank you so much. Well, hey, thank you very much for having me. Good to see you all here today. I want to say a special thank you to the uh, Coalition to End Social Isolation and Loneliness. Uh, there's a coalition for everything, as I found out. I, I've been in Congress for two years. Uh, but I want to tell you how I got to uh, this topic. Uh, it's a very unique story. I have been a broadcaster since I started in high school at 15, and uh, I now own radio stations and TV stations across Nebraska, and that's my day job. I've been in our state legislature for over 10 years. Uh, <clears throat> but when the COVID pandemic hit uh, in March of 2020, all of my advertisers canceled in March because they couldn't sell cars and they couldn't sell retail products and um, what was ironic about that is that, and I have my own independent news network called News Channel Nebraska, uh, is that uh, everybody was watching TV because everybody was home, but none of my advertisers were willing to spend any money because nobody could go to work. And so I had to get really creative. I have 200 employees. I got to make sure they keep uh, getting paid and uh, they couldn't come to work. And this is before the Paycheck Protection Program. And so I... I was walking around the YMCA, just kind of racking my brain. What could I do? And I thought, you know, there's so many people that are at home and all my TV station was talking about was COVID, 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 COVID. It was just over the top. Every, you know, people were consuming it, but you got sick of hearing the word. You got sick of looking at that ugly little, you know, uh, that micro uh, cell, whatever it is with the pointy things. And so I decided to, uh, I rented out like a space and I welcomed bands because you could only have 10 people in a place uh, you know, to gather under the rules, the health department rules. And so I brought in polka bands. I brought in uh, rock bands, country bands, uh, jazz musicians, uh, country singers, old time country, um, you name it. I had it, any kind of music, any kind of venue. And so for two hours, and I actually, to, to protect my employees, I had my two young sons running uh, the cameras. You know, one of them was 10 years old on a milk crate. Uh, but this TV station I have goes across the entire state. And over the course of the next two years, I got over 4,000 handwritten letters, mostly from widows in their 70s, in their 80s, that were absolutely heartbroken and lonely. And they poured everything out into these letters. They, the, Some of the bands that I had, you know, the, the Leo Lani Orchestra, a prior version of that same orchestra, maybe played at their wedding in 1960 and they were reminded of the good times. And I got letters from people that said tears are streaming down my face watching this band because it reminds me of when I was young and I was part of the community and I was dancing at these ballrooms and my husband was there and we, we were about to have kids and it brought back all these memories. And then in, in the letter, they would talk about how desperately lonely they are, that they have diabetes, that they are, battling depression, and they would pour their heart out in a handwritten letter that was mailed to me. And it really struck me that uh, there are a lot of really socially isolated, lonely people that are living in rural areas, sometimes miles away from the house. And uh, I decided when I got to Congress that we need to understand what's happening. Uh, we need to understand why somebody 37 miles from a rural hospital would call the rescue unit 12 times a year simply because he wanted to see somebody. Uh, go into the emergency room and talk to five or six different providers. There's nothing wrong with him medically. He's just lonely. And then I started talking to folks for the uh, rural postal service, the, the rural mail carriers, and the urban mail carriers. And they'll tell me that when they walk up to Alice's house, if they don't see her in the window, because this is the only person each day that Alice has sees another human. They walk up and they peek in her window to find out if she's okay. And on a number of occasions, they can see her legs or, or their, their, uh, 
the residents' legs sticking out of the kitchen, they've fallen and they don't have anybody there to help them. And that's when the postal carrier calls 911. There are a lot of people that are suffering in silence. And to be honest, from a taxpayer standpoint, when they present themselves in the emergency room, it's far worse than had we found a way to, to provide some kind of human touch, some, some preventative care. And the reason it strikes me so much is that my mom was a, a psychiatric home health nurse for a long time for, for like a day center where people with mental health challenges would, would be able to go to a day room and, and then she would check on them at home. And she knew that if they weren't coming to the door, if they were not tracking, that she had to talk them into taking their medicine again and to keep them out of the emergency room. None of that was uh, reimbursable for Medicaid. It's a non-medical model. She wasn't there to provide any service other than to check on them. And our system doesn't reward that kind of prevention. And so as I think about social isolation and loneliness, I think about who in our society can be out there to provide that human touch. How good is the senior center? It's only as good as the people that run it. I always joke, I don't know how many people here, I'm from a rural state, but anybody know what Golden Corral is, right? Part of me thinks we need a Golden Corral in every town because that draws people out that are elderly. They have a lot of different choices and the food is reasonably priced. And we have to figure out ways to get the Alice out of the house. We have to figure out ways to make them want to walk out of the house. And I think personally, you know, the United Kingdom started looking at this in 2015. America's, you know, uh, we're behind. But I was so pleased to see the Surgeon General come out and identify this as a public health concern. And I just had a TV station in Omaha ask me today. They knew I was coming here. They said, what can we be doing now before the legislation gets going? And I said, it's as easy as knocking on your neighbor's door and saying, hey, you okay? I haven't seen you for a while. You know, I know we don't get to talk much, but I just want to check on you. Uh, that human touch is so important. I also think with telehealth, there's opportunities. There's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of elderly folks that like their Sudoku or they like playing certain games. And you can tell electronically if they've been playing that game. And if, if they aren't playing it for three days in a row, somebody needs to call them and say, hey, you know, Marge, are, are you okay? We noticed you haven't been playing your game. Um, I look at all these rural hospitals that are critical access centers and they get a special form of reimbursement. And I think, how can we energize them to very safely reach out to people and say, you doing okay? Are you taking your medicine? Um, can we see your house? Uh, you know, a lot of hoarders out there, a lot of folks that end up in, in unhealthy situations, they just get stuck in there. And so here's what I've done is I came to Congress, uh, thanks to uh, the Coalition to End Social Isolation and Loneliness. Uh, they saw a bill that I introduced was one of my first bills, and it basically says, before we march headfirst into what the programming should be, let's define what social isolation and loneliness is. Let's uh, figure out how we're going to measure what progress is. And since then, Senator Murphy uh, from Connecticut and Senator Pete Ricketts from Nebraska, who I talked into this, he, he was governor uh, at the time this was all happening in our state, we're all working together on, on collaborating to go to the GAO. We're going to ask the GAO to agglomerate all the different data that's out there and, and let's start there and then work our way into the future. Now, what I have learned since this whole thing started is that, you know, I may be in the rural health lane with, uh, with elderly population. Uh, there are all sorts of different folks that are battling social isolation and loneliness. I talked to a mom the other day uh, in my district, and she's got one daughter. Well, let me back up. I talked to a group of uh, students at Schuyler High School in Schuyler, Nebraska, almost all Latino, uh, meatpacking town. And I talked to the seniors, and I said, all right, who's going to college? All the girls raised their hand, high and proud. None of the boys. And I said, uh, hey, guys, what are you thinking? And the teachers started looking at me like, ask them more questions. And uh, they weren't thinking college was in their future. And I got to talking afterwards with the teacher and I said, what's going on? Why are the girls so excited about going to college and, and none of the boys? And she says, a lot of these boys get sucked into gaming at night. Some of them are using marijuana. Uh, they don't leave their basement. 
all their social interaction is electronic. And I've got a senior in high school this coming year, and I started to look at ratios of who's going to college. University of Georgia, 35% male, 65% female. Something's going on with boys. I, I, and I can't prove it from a science perspective, but talking to my constituents, I'm talking to moms that are like, my girls are out there and they're, they're doing great in school. My son just sits inside and he's playing those games and he's gambling. Uh, he's electronic gambling. And they're sitting in the house and they're 24 years old. And uh, talking to Senator Murphy, he comes at this from maybe an adolescent young adult standpoint. That's just as important. That social isolation is just as important. And so I don't profess to have any of the answers. Uh, I am a policymaker that recognizes that what's happening now is not healthy. I think this existed long before the COVID epidemic. It just exposed itself to me during the COVID epidemic. And it's something that we as Americans need to do something about. It's as simple as caring about your neighbor. It's as complicated as providing that health care prevention that gets somebody tracking again on their on their meds. And uh, maybe it's the U.S. Postal Service. Maybe it's maybe it's a system of volunteers. If you think about the U.S. Postal Service, what other federal agency touches every doorknob in the in the in America every day? And the last I checked, they are looking for ways to make the numbers work. And so I'm looking for ways to to use people that are out there and that care and that are trustworthy. Because the last thing I want to do is set somebody up with somebody that that could prey on a vulnerable individual, which happens all too often. So with that, I would add uh, just a few uh, closing remarks. Um, I did not realize how bipartisan this issue was until I got into it. And it's been a delight to work with people on both sides of the aisle, because I think at the end of the day, we all very much care about this issue and doing something very positive. My biggest fear about this issue is that it's so complex and it's so big that we can throw as much money as we want at it and you won't get the results that you want. And so I'm very focused on let's identify what loneliness is. Let's identify what our benchmarks are and let's identify the data that we need to look at to say, are we moving the needle or not? So that whatever we invest in, whatever that is, is something that actually helps Americans move out of social isolation and end loneliness. And uh, I think I probably share that with all of you. So with that, I want to congratulate you for uh, for doing everything you've done as a coalition. And I look forward to working with you. Uh, happy to interact. And I would encourage you uh, to find me on LinkedIn under Mike Flood Congress, F-L-O-O-D. I put a lot of stuff on there about the loneliness efforts, and uh, it's a good way to keep in touch. Thank you.